Welcome to WeChat Divorce. Hello, I'm Karen Shalou, Legal Liaison, here with Katherine Shanahan, CDFA. We're the co-founders of My Divorce Solution, a company whose mission is to provide a rock-solid financial premise for anyone thinking about or going through a divorce. With the development and delivery of the MDS Financial Portrait, individuals and couples can now make financially smart decisions and have clarity as to the short and long-term impact of those decisions during the divorce experience. Each podcast, we sit down with professionals who provide insight and frank discussion about real people, real situations, and real divorce. Today, we welcome Kate Anthony. Kate is the host of the critically acclaimed and New York Times recommended podcast, the Divorce Survival Guide, the Divorce Survival Guide podcast, and the creator of the groundbreaking online coaching program, Should I Stay or Should I Go?, which helps women make the most difficult decision of their lives using coaching tools, relationship education, geeky neuroscience, community support, and deep self-work. Kate empowers women to find their strength, passion, and confidence, even in the most disempowering of circumstances, and helps them move forward with concrete plans set on a solid foundation, putting their children at the center, not in the middle, of all of their decisions. In addition to her online programs, Kate works privately with clients all over the world. Kate lives in Los Angeles with her teenage son, and she lovingly co-parents with her ex-husband, their two dogs, and a handful of fish. Kate, thank you for being here today to talk about your mission to answer the hard questions of divorce. Welcome. Thanks so much for having me. I'm so happy to be here. Hi, Kate. Hi. I like the handful of fish. <laughs> yes, they're the most important, really. You know, I, I said to my ex yesterday, we were redoing my son's room for his birthday next week, and I said, turn to my ex, and I was like, fish are so much more high maintenance than you ever want to think that they are. <laughs> they, re I mean, they, they, are. they really are fresh water really or are. salt water right oh well salt water forget i mean i i just have i just have fresh water salt water are that's in, that's an insane commitment yeah but we even googled like we have uh one kind of fish we call him sucky he's like a sucker fish that goes around the bottom and cleans the algae and we googled like how long is this guy gonna live and it turns <laughs> out like a really long time oh, gosh. <laughs> Well, I hope he does his job sucking all the algae. You know, he really does. But I was like, are you taking him to college? <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> Turns out I haven't been to have this fish for like the next 25 oh years. My goodness. <laughs> That's hilarious. <laughs> Totally I guess, go, I guess gone are the days when the goldfish dies and you run to the fish store just to replace the goldfish. <laughs> right, totally. Well, that's how we started. And then we got into this whole uh -huh. thing. <laughs> and then you're going to have the conversation, should you stay or should you go? <laughs> <laughs> So it's interesting. So should you stay or should you go? I know I battled that question myself when I got divorced eight years ago after being married for 20 years and raising five children with a blended family, you know, the right to be happy is the question that many women, especially in the gray divorce era, that the husband isn't necessarily such a bad guy, but you just want to be happy and you have to sit there and tinker with, should I just be happy or do I just stay and just kind of live my life out because it's not so bad from the outside for many people. How do you help women decide that? Well, um, you know, that's, that's, that's a great question. And I, and I, and I appreciate that you framed it that way too, because, you know, there are so many people that are struggling with this just from a, like, he's, he's fine. Like, he's not a bad guy. Right. Like, I mean, I deal with a lot of emotional abuse and all of that stuff. And that's a little bit, I'm not going to say easier cut and dry, because it's actually very difficult for women to extricate themselves from those situations. But even just I think for women in particular, the notion that we actually deserve to be happy is so difficult for us, you know, culturally speaking, uh, and this is part of the work that I do with women in my program, right, is really sort of unpack all the cultural influences on marriage, as well as, you know, what's going on internally for yourself, right? But 
for, but culturally speaking, women are, you know, we are the nurturers. We put everyone's needs before our own. We have, you know, we make sure that everybody else in our lives are happy and we are always last. And that's something we have to stop doing. And so when we, you know, from a cultural perspective, we have to stop doing that. We have to stop doing that to ourselves. We have to stop doing that to other women. Like that's a whole thing to unpack, right? Um, but when we're standing in this moment of, wait a minute, <laughs> you know, we have to stop doing it to ourselves and we have to recognize that we really truly do deserve to be happy. That, you know, as Mary Oliver so beautifully put it, this is our one wild and precious life and how we live it, um, you know, this is it. This is it. Right. And is this really how you want to do it? And, you know, the other thing that we really um, unpack in my, in my programs and, and that I talk to my private clients about um, is, you know, what are we mirroring to our children? Because, you know, I often have people flip the script, right? If, what would you say if your daughter came to you and was telling you this, you know, that, that he's great and all these things, but you just feel like something's missing. Right. And, you know, the, the first thing I have people do, right. Because we don't want to make that, we don't want to get out of that marriage and then make the same mistakes again and realize like, Oh wait, I was the problem. Right. And, you know, so if you have a depth and a, and a, and a sort of level of lack of fulfillment, um, in your heart, the first thing we have to do is look at that from an objective perspective and really do the work to make sure, um, that, this isn't going to just follow you, you know, that your lack of fulfillment is actually because of the marriage, not just because for yourself, not just your own lack of fulfillment, right? Because you don't want to get out and realize you're still feeling exactly the same way because that would <laughs> right. suck, right? right? So the first, the first thing we do is, is the self-work, the, the confidence building, the self-esteem, the self-knowledge, the self-understanding, like all of that um, emotional intelligence work. Um, and then we can start talking about the cultural aspects and how that impacts and then, you know, communication styles and stuff. But the first thing you have to do is actually work on yourself. Right. Mm -hmm. And so often when we're questioning, we're so focused on the other person. Ugh, he does this or he does that. Or, ugh, ugh, ugh. Right. But you, you got to take that off the table and focus, self-focus first. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, you know, the, you know, the divorce rate for second and third marriages is really, really bad, really, really high, <laughs> you know, it's mm -hmm. higher. It's ex mm -hmm. it, like, it keeps going up the more times. And it's because, mm -hmm. you know, we're just like, oh, he was the problem. Let me get a new one. Right. You know? Right. So, yeah. so how do you, when, when someone comes to you, like how, how long does it take to kind of transition through that and do that work when they're considering divorce, which is almost like an intensive care situation. So yeah. sometimes well, they can be in harm's way, but also if they need to do this work as well, how do, how do you help them with that? Well, so, I mean, it really depends where people are on their trajectory, mm -hmm. right? Often I work with women who, so if you work with me privately, one-on-one, -on -one, it's a three month, we have a three month coaching agreement. Um, you know, people want to hire a coach for like one session or like, can I just do it for a month? Then it's like, no, you wouldn't hire a therapist for one session. <laughs> right? Oh, right. And right. while coaching is different from therapy, it is still an ongoing and in-depth process that you need to commit to for yourself. Right. right. We're not just going to like get that answer in one, uh, in one session or even in a kinda month. Like, because it's kind of like me with a diet. <laughs> I want to yeah. lose all my weight in a week. <laughs> right. Exactly. Exactly. Um, so we, you know, we can't, so, so, so for, for one-on-one -on -one work, it's, it's three months and it's pretty intense and ongoing. And, you know, some people make that, make the decision. And, you know, a lot of women that come to me, they, they just need permission. They need someone to tell their story to and have someone say, it's okay. You don't have to, you know, you don't have to stay, right? Um, but then we got to do the deeper work. And then, so it depends. Like for some people, they hire me and within the second week, we're like, okay, we're making plans. Mm -hmm. um, and for some people, it takes three months before they're ready to have that conversation. Right. Um, you know, and then I have my online program, should I stay or should I go? That's self-paced, right? So you go through all the work on your own 
And, you know, I, I don't know how long it takes people, right? It really depends. It's so mm -hmm. individual. Um, but I would say three months is about the amount of time that you need to kind of go through the process. That doesn't necessarily mean that it'll take you three months before you get clarity and take action, mm -hmm. right? Because right. there's an ongoing process beyond the clarity and the action, right? There's, there's so much more to unpack once you've made the decision too. Right. So we're in a unique situation where we just deal with their finances, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, you know, having financial knowledge is a very empowering position to be in. Yeah. And because I have a financial background and upbringing, I, I devalue the power that actually has. So I just think it's a norm for people just because that's my background. So I always find it really enlightening when I see that somebody can look at a bank statement and, or a financial statement and, and then feel some peace of mind. Or when Karen works with somebody with their budget and I talk to them afterwards, I see that they have like some enlightenment in their face or they feel a little better about themselves because they understand that, oh, I can have some extra money or, oh, there is a reason that I need to get a job or a reason I need to do something a little bit better or as Karen puts it, they have a little power over their spending to make their lives easier. It, it, it makes them feel better that they can have some control over this. And that if they can control the financial part or have an understanding of that, now they can make a decision about the emotional side or they can work yeah. on that piece of their life, right? So to be able to decide on this part of their life, they can now put that into perspective to make the decision that they can decide if they should stay or go based on yeah. something else, not yeah. based on the financial piece. Yes. Whether yeah. it be tough or hard, you know, your happiness should not be dependent on your financial life. It should be dependent on your emotional life, really, yeah. for your health and well being, right? Yeah. Yeah. So I guess it would be nice for you to be able to, for us, we always, we never want somebody to get divorced without any financial clarity. No, I mean, yeah. That's absolutely. And, you know, I don't do that. Right. But I always recommend <laughs> like you're going to want to figure that out. You're going to want to go to people like like you guys mm -hmm. to, sit to like really figure this out because, you know, it, it should not be part of the decision making process and it has to be part of the process. Right. So right. you need to know you that people do need to know and they need to have they need to have that clarity. Um, you know, and, and sometimes that clarity is, is part of the decision-making process because it's at least a, t a part of the timeline or, um, part of the, um, uh, yeah, I mean the, the, the timeline or just, you know, just gathering the facts, right. Getting as much information as possible. It's like, okay, you know, that you want to do this before you have the conversation, let's figure, you know, you should figure out the finances because, you know, it may not be safe for you to just like cut and run and walk out, right? You're going to need to, and a lot of women, I will say, I find it, I don't know if you guys find this, but a lot of women are really disempowered around their finances and they don't actually know what the situation is. Um, you know, I also deal with a lot of financial abuse where they're, you know, just even as simple as they just don't have access to their bank, to the records. They don't have the passwords, right? I Which... Which and, they, they, and some banks won't give them access if they've right. not had a relationship, even though it's a joint account. There's yeah. so many that will not even engage a conversation with them that, you know, we're able to step in and assist that. But to your point, they're in bondage, not only to their um, inability to access information, but in their relationship with their spouse and with the financial institution. They, you know, even if they wanted to, they don't have the uh, ability to gain the knowledge that they need to gain without right. help, for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah it's, um, and it's, it's really, um, uh, it can be so disempowering and it can make women feel like they don't have choices, right? Mm -hmm. And, you know, that's sort of, that's even part, I think, of the, of the manipulation right, is to make them feel like they don't have choices or that they don't have the option. Mm -hmm. um, and that's, you know, and that 
and for women sometimes to actually recognize that as being a, a source of power and control can be very eye-opening. Yes. Right? Yes. So when they come to us, when, when they are thinking divorce, we would do their financial portrait with them, gather their financials and let them know what look lo life looks like now, why they're married and what it could look like if they got divorced. And then at least they can go to you afterwards and then work through what your private sessions are or their, their your, your online sessions are. Because right. once you don't have to worry about what it would look like financially, whether it's good or bad, mm -hmm. then you can work through what it looks like financially, I mean, emotionally to be on your own, because yeah. it is a lot, it, there's, there's a lot. I mean, if divorce was easy, believe me, a lot more people would be doing it. Divorce is not easy, right? but it's not. divorce sometimes is a better solution for a lot of people um, because it just is. It's just a matter of how you want to live your life for the rest of your life. And now during COVID, people are realizing after being stuck at home, what do you want the rest of your life to look like? you know, yeah. you know, yeah. people and even conversely, some people, the first, the first thing out of their mouth. And I know I did this many years in my <laughs> marriage before I actually um, made the move. What my first reaction was I want out before, before I ever knew the facts of anything, because uh -huh. that's just a fight or flight response, I guess. So, you know, when you have that financial clarity and then you have that thought in your mind, you're able to deal with it on a different level if you already know the, the financial piece of it. Um, yeah. Because for some people, once they see the, have the financial clarity, all of a sudden they want to work on their marriage or they want to do things to make their marriage better because they are not, they are not willing to sign up for what that financial clarity is bringing to them. So it can go one way or the other. It can go, oh, I can do this. I can live my new independent life. Or it can also be, oh, maybe my quick response should be something a little different to your point of should I stay or should I go? Yeah, and I think that, you know, one of, one of the things that I, that I often um, think about or, or talk about, you know, we, we look at, at values, right? One of the things that I really do in my, in my work is values work. And, you know, sometimes financial stability is a more, or financial, you know, wealth or right, a lifestyle is a, is a more important value than a emo deep emotional connection or, you know, something like that, like, like, or the business um, of your marriage or the family that you've created is, can be more uh, have more w emotional weight than some of the things that you think are missing, right? And so, and that's that's fine, right? There's no judgment there, um, but that's the work that you want to do to uncover, right? So it's like, all right, you want to look at your financial picture, and here's the lifestyle hit you're probably you may take, mm -hmm. um, and some people when they see that are like, no, I'm good, <laughs> you know, and and you're and to your point, they're more willing to do the work to like, okay, maybe I really do need to go to that therapy appointment and like actually talk out these things that are kind of hard to talk about. Um, or maybe I need to just adjust my expectations, you know? Exactly. Yeah. And I think that, and I think, you know, it would behoove a lot of people to adjust expectations in marriage, right? Because <laughs> we're handed this insane, um, I don't know, you know, fairy tale from the fairy tales from Nicholas Sparks from all of that. Right. And so, so often it's yeah. really like, you know, you, we're not meant to get all that we, you know, want or need from one individual, you know, right. and, Absolutely. and, you know, I think that women get a lot of their emotional needs met from other women. And that's wonderful. If you can just sort of, adjust that that like yeah you know probably he's you know he may not be capable or may not even be the one right are you okay if you get your emotional fulfillment from other women do you need to like really refresh your friendships and really commit more to the friends that you have um or how about finding the happiness within yourself so yeah. you know i always you know I, I like to talk to the younger girls today and even you know my own daughter getting married and 
making sure that you're content with your own life or making sure that you have your own expectations. She's getting married now. And it's about communicating and setting out what are your expectations financially and emotionally with each other mm -hmm. because yeah. things will changing will change. I mean, when you're getting married. So because we're in the financial field, of course, it is the expectations and the boundaries within each other. So even within marriages now during COVID, we've, we're getting all these calls and the emergencies that people feel that they're in, whether it be an emergency divorce or emergency this, nothing's an emergency. You know, step back and pause with, and find it within yourself. So if you need to have these tough conversations, even if it is whether we stay or whether we go, um, what are your expectations within yourself or within your partner and what are the financials? So we think everyone should have a financial portrait, whether you're married or you, whether you're staying or you're going, you need to find out what your financial household looks like. Right. Whether right. you're staying together, whether you're divorcing and you need to figure out whether you're staying or you're going, what your value system is like you're saying. Yep. Basically. That's very important. Right. Yeah. yeah. It's, it, a good, I mean, it, it's a absolutely. good exercise. You know? well, it's, and it's a really important exercise when I do it because a lot of times, you know, I do the values work and I really help you and, it, and it's deep. It's not just like, here's a list. What are your values? Like, that's not what I do. Right. Um, it's really deep. And then you can see like, oh, these are like really important core values that I have that completely misalign with the person I'm married to. And I may not have realized that when I got married when I was 25, but like, now that I'm 45, that actually really matters to me, you know, and, you know, sometimes the misalignments are so stark that it's really clear that this is not a good match and it helps take the heat off of it. Right. It's not his fault that, that, or, you know, or her fault that there's a, that there's a misalignment here. Um, it's, it's just a misalignment. Right. right. And, and, and you can take the blame off of that. You can like, you know, release all the, you know, um, criticism or whatever um and just be like oh wow look at that like those socks don't match <laughs> right right <laughs> like right <laughs> one is like big and fluffy and made for the winter and the other one is like you know for tennis so there's nothing wrong with either sock you just don't want to wear them together right exactly and what's wrong with having that discussion with your partner because totally. maybe he feels the same way or she exactly. feels the same way exactly uh -huh. exactly yes yeah. That's an interesting yeah. conversation. I mean, it's a tough conversation, but yeah. 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 And your partner may be like, doesn't bother me, you know, right, exactly. <laughs> but that doesn't mean that it doesn't have to bother you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right. That's so you true. Act upon it. Right. Right. Yeah. yeah. You still get to have your feelings about it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You said something interesting about, you know, we, we do everything for our kids and for our external surroundings. I know when I left my marriage, my financial picture was fairly dismal. I was young, we were living paycheck to paycheck, but that didn't mean that I didn't need to make those steps forward. And I clearly remember thinking, I not only have to make this decision for myself, I have to make this decision because I have two kids that are following in my footsteps and they're not gonna do what I tell them they're to do. They're gonna do what I do, they're going. so. I need to empower myself so that they will empower themselves. And that's something that really helped me make that decision because it was really hard to do for myself. But because I knew I had to do it for them as well, it gave me that extra little bit of strength that really helped me make good decisions. Yeah. That I would not, I don't know if I would have had the strength to otherwise make that. Yeah. And I don't know if you are having the same experience I'm having, but you know, my son is about to turn 15 and he just had his first girlfriend mm -hmm. and he just, and he's starting to have these conversations where I'm realizing I'm, it's like, it's not even specific or linear, but I'm realizing, Oh my God, it worked. <laughs> you know, like, Oh my God you know, this kid, and, and I left my marriage specifically for my son. I looked at what we were modeling and I looked at the toxicity and I looked at the, you know, the volatility. And I was like, this is, I have to leave this for my son because my son will 100% grow up to repeat what we have. Um, and he will choose he will, you know, choose women that he can dominate and abuse and he will choose, 
you know, um, you know, all, all of the things that he was witnessing in our, in our marriage. And, you know, and it, it felt like, it felt like really clear, like, of course I had to do that. But at the same time, there was a little bit of a gamble, <laughs> you know, because part of it too was like, I wanted, I knew that my ex and I were brought out the worst in each other. And I, and I had a, a inkling that he was a better person than he was to me. And I knew that I had the possibility to be a better person than I was with him. And that together we could actually go on to create something better. Like maybe he could marry somebody else that was, he had a better relationship with and model something better. Maybe I would too, you know, and the fact of the matter is I'm still single and, but it doesn't matter because what he sees is someone who he sees, you know, a strong independent woman who doesn't take crap from anybody you know, who doesn't allow her to, you know, and every time I've been in a relationship and it's ended, we've had conversations about why the relationship ended. And some of it's, sometimes it's a mismatch and sometimes he didn't treat me well. And sometimes, right. So there's, we get to have these conversations, you know, and his dad is remarried. Um, and I think they have a better relationship than we have, but I, you know, who knows I'm not in it. Um, but the but I am noticing now in the conversations that we have about relationships, about dating, about all of the stuff that he re- like the messages got through, and they really did sink in. And the decisions that he's making for himself, like he just ended this thing with this girl that he was really into, it was his first relationship, first girlfriend, and he ended it because she was being inconsistent. And she told him in the beginning that she was inconsistent in relationships. They got into the relationship. She was inconsistent. And he was like, oh yeah, I don't want that. Good for him. And I was like, yes, yes, yes. I did it. <laughs> you know, like, yeah. 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 And, and so, so, I mean, just to your, to your, your point, Karen, right? Like that we are, we are making these decisions, not just for ourselves, but we are, we are setting the foundation um, for, you know, if, if you look at your marriage and your relationship and ask yourself, do I want my, do I want my child to have this relationship? And the answer is like, absolutely not. Then you should probably think about getting out of that relationship. (laughs) So good. Yeah. Yeah. It's so hard for the women in it though, to really believe that, you know, they're in it and they're feeling it. Yep. And they just can't, they can't see it you know. They, well, exactly. They, but, and that's why they have to do the work. Yeah. That's yeah. why, mm-hmm. you know, I, I say like, you know, you can listen to all the podcasts in the world. You can listen to my podcast. You can listen to your podcast. You can read the books, but if you're not doing the work, you're not actually changing anything for yourself. Right. I right. totally agree with that. Yeah. They look at you and they look at me and they look at Karen and they say, gosh, I just wish I can get there. And what they forget is that the three of us were where they were and absolutely we cried our tears like they have and we've lived those days they just want to be where we were well, they want to be where we are now they just right. forget that we we were where they are now um, exactly. and that's what we try to remind them that we were there it's just yep. that you yeah know, you know i'm eight years later and you guys are however many years you are i'm 11 um, years later and yeah. and here's the deal right like the only difference is that I did the work. It's the only difference. Right. Right. It's not. And I always, I always say this, like, and people talk about my people who are just getting divorced or like, how do I create something like you and your ex have? And I'm like, girl, it took 11 years (laughs) and it's still ongoing. He texted me this morning and he, or last night and he was like, Hey, can we have a conversation about our boundaries? I feel like we have to like, you know, and I was like, God, great. Here we go again. Um, <laughs> yeah. lost it, but like, yeah. you know, this is the deal. This is what it's like. Yeah. And yeah. you know, you can't compare the beginning of your divorce process to mine 11 years down the line, yours, eight years down the line, whatever it is. Right. Yeah, like exactly. Mine was, a, <laughs> you know, mine was a total cluster, you know, 11 years ago. <laughs> and I think a lot of them are, I was talking to my son older and um he's in a relationship and was in a relationship and you know i i think in the beginning of the breakups or whatever it is there's a ton of emotion and as you do the work as we're talking about it pivots to 
finding a solution or it needs to pivot to what's the solution here versus my anger and resentment and bitterness. So at some point, we all have to learn to, to go to that other place of how do we get to some resolution here? Mm -hmm. um, otherwise, nobody benefits. So if nothing else, I reminded him, I said, please remember that your dad thinks I'm his best friend now. So, you know, on that level, there was a lot of work to get there because it wasn't that easy all the time. Um, no. Yeah, and it all goes back to the value system that you were talking about. A lot of us are, or a lot of clients that we have come in and they're in a very controlling relationship and they just, in order to leave that relationship, they need someone else to quote, fix it, whether it's us or whether it's a therapist and they don't realize that there is a lot of work to do. Um, I was sitting with a client and an attorney, we were handing over her financial file. She was. Um, she had to go to litigation and um, she made the comment, oh, thank God I can just give it to him and he'll take care of it. I said, oh no, now more than ever, you have to be engaged and a part of the process because this is the rest of your life. You don't just hand it to somebody. So, uh, you know, that's, that's part of the work that everybody has to face when going through a divorce. They have to acquire the financial clarity and they have to, your point, acquire what are my values and how do I do the hard work? How do I empower myself to get to that other side? That's, yeah. Yeah. And, and doing the work, you know, sometimes the roadblock to that, because doing the work will heal your resentments, right? You, when I work with clients, we do like a rigorous um, inventory and that inventory helps heal those resentments because you start to see like, oh, look at the red flag I missed there. Oh, and, and I missed that one too. And oh, that happened like on our second date, right? And you start to look at, and oh, look, that's my parenting. That's actually my, my sort of generational trauma that has me choose, right? And you really start to like dig through this stuff. And so, you, so you, in doing so, you heal the resentments so that you can go into um, your divorce thinking of this as like, oh, look, we're mismatched socks. We're not like, there's nothing wrong with, with, with mm -hmm. him. Um, and some people don't want to do that. Some people are very, very committed to their resentments. Mm -hmm. And those are the people in my experience, and I'm sure probably yours too. Those are the people that end up in litigation, right? The people who are a hundred percent committed <laughs> <laughs> to their resentments and to blaming right. the other person, <laughs> right? Yeah. That's yeah. like, you know, the feeding ground for litigation. Right. Well, I find that, I, lo I love that term, Kate. I'm go I think I'm going to have to borrow that from you. So I say, I heal your resentment. So yeah. I find that interesting because I, I say it a different way, but I, I really love that because um, I always say, financial people and attorneys never put the emotional value to a financial document or a financial settlement. Yeah. They only use it as a straight line item as a financial distribution, right? So they just yeah. kind of put what's here and there. Nothing's, you know, they use the word fair and equitable, but they don't really know what the term means because yeah. couples just look at it as, you know, the pension's mine because I worked there 30 years. So I put the emotional value to that. The guy is really, or the girl is really saying it's there because I had my blood, sweat and tears working at that company all those years where you really stayed home and did nothing. Where when you say that to a mom who's a stay at home mom is saying, seriously, jackass, I stayed home, blood, sweat and tears and took care of the house, the kids, the dog, the fish and everything else, your dinner, your food, the laundry and everything else while you just went to work. And I right. did 24 seven and the emotional value to that is so much higher. So as a financial person, to me, I'm looking at the emotional piece to all of that. And so the reason to letting go to the resentment of me letting you just go to work and you staying home, that's such a good piece for me. I just, I just use it a different way. Yeah. So yeah. When I sit with a company couple and I review their financial portrait, 
I have these meetings with them and I get all of that out because th what, what I just said to you is what I get, I provide that space that they get to say that to each other. They yeah. get to say all that. And especially now during COVID, the men and the women are home together. So the man is, or I, I don't want to do a gender thing because listen, there's a lot of women who are, or dads who are stay-at-home dads and the moms are out being the breadwinner. So excuse me, if you're listening to this, I don't mean to do that because there's a lot of role reversal now. So I'm going to just put that out there as a disclaimer. If you're listening, I know it goes both ways, um, but I still am a little old school here. So, um, but now that both parties are at home, the stay-at-home mom or dad is seeing that other role and they want to get back to work right now because they can't stand the homeschooling and having to see kids at home all day 24 7 they're seeing how hard it is and i bet you these parents are willing to give up their pension because they'd rather be at home at work right now they see yeah. how hard it is to be at stay at home mom right, now. right? They're, saying, they're calling now nobody's saying i'm not going to slip my pension because i rather be at home i'd be at, rather be at work right now because it's hard to do the laundry do the kids do everything um being a stay-at-home mom i bet you today is being really valued now that COVID's here. So yeah. our conversations now, people calling, it's very different. But letting go of that resentment, like you said, um, is really good because there's a big emotional piece to the financials, just like you're saying with the resentment work that you do. What was that yeah. line again? I want to write it down because I'm going to miss it. Oh, I guess you were saying, but healing, healing your resentments. Healing that can, resentments. So I need to write that down. Yeah. Because yeah. it, it plays true for the financial piece. It's really good. Yeah. So when you start to, when you take the heat off of things and you stop blaming and shaming and all of that stuff, you're left with, um, you know, oh, okay. Like it's just, we just, we're not doing that anymore, right? When you stop doing that, you're not doing that. And then you've got something else that you can create together. Right. That's, yeah. you know. More based in res mutual respect right and, yeah so what are your top like three tips for people when they say should i stay or should i go um the first is to um this great old 12-step program uh slogan which is um uh put down the magnifying glass and put and pick up the mirror so let's really look at yourself real and and that's the whole hardest part, right? It is the hardest thing to do. We don't want to do it. We want it to be his fault, <laughs> right? Or her fault. Um, so anybody's but ours, anybody but me, right? Cause that's the harder work. So mm -hmm. be willing to do that harder work and look at yourself. Um, and you know, and then look at, you know, what are your, are your expectations being, uh, you know, are your expectations unreasonable, right? Is, is this just marriage in the 21st century, <laughs> right? Like mm -hmm. with all of our cultural conditioning and the mental load and all of that stuff that's very real, um, you know, and then, you know, we look at, and, and also, you know, in doing the work, in doing the personal work, um, really getting clear on your own, your own worth, right? And knowing that, first of all, if you're being emotionally abused in any way, shape or form, you, there is help um, and you should seek it. And because you are worth more, you know, um, no one is worth being treated like that. They're just simply not. And, uh, and if you're not and you're just unhappy, you, you deserve to be happy, but you got to figure out why you're not happy. And it's, it's entirely possible that your marriage is making you unhappy and that otherwise you're fulfilled in all of those things. And it's okay. It's okay to leave a marriage that is otherwise, you know, quote, great. Um, if you are legitimately not happy, you know, yeah. I, I say it all the time and it's sort of trite, but it's so, tr but it's like also really deep, which is that you deserve to be happy. Mm -hmm. you do I totally agree yeah yep that's very good it's really good I don't know if that Happy was for good. that I think I that was so for your uh program should I stay or should I go 
is it, how, how does that play out? Is it like different steps you go through? I think I heard you say you do it at your own pace. So yeah, talk a little bit about that. So it's an online program so that it's, you know, go at your own. I used to run it live a couple times a year, but at the end of the day, when someone's in crisis, they don't want to be told like, and in, and in six months, I'll be starting another cohort. Like, no. <laughs> so it's, so it is self-paced. You you buy it online. There's tons of videos and audios and worksheets and I guide you through the whole process. Um, I, you know, I prefer people do it in order as it's presented because things, they're building blocks. Um, and then, um, and, and, you know, with that, we have, um, I have um, bi-monthly community calls. So, um, you know, twice a, twice a week, we, we, I mean, every, every two weeks we get on the phone and there's, it's a whole community, you know, and, and, a, and a private Facebook group and stuff like that. Um, and it, it was designed to take three months because when I used to take people through it as a cohort, it was a three month program, but now it's, it is self-paced. So you can, you can whip through it <laughs> or you can take a good three to six months to go through it. It's really whatever, um, whatever works for you. Okay. Um, and I'm actually redesigning it. I'm in the process of redesigning it. So I'm going to be breaking things up a little bit. Okay. Yeah. That's excellent. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you for being on the podcast with us today. Thank you so much for having me. I so appreciate it. Thank you. Welcome. Your work is really important because it really um, kind of calls for and creates awareness of that pause before you make any step that will forever change the rest of your life. Absolutely. So, yeah. And I love that. yeah, it is a pause, right? It is a you know, and I have clients who want to like rush, rush, rush and get the, uh, like if I make this decision and move and I get, get, get out. That's like, uh, -uh. <laughs> right. pause, get things together, do your due diligence, get your finances in order. No, you know, get, it, this is all data collection, right? There's emotional data, there's financial data, there's, you know, exactly. all of it. Exactly. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. So yeah. for more information about Kate Anthony, you can find her on kateanthony.com, wonderful website. Um, and we look forward to being with all of you on our next podcast. Take care. <laughs>